Uh, uh, from nearest to me by, uh, by Rumi Ali from uh, BRAC, who's uh, working, worked with uh, the private sector in uh, banking uh, and is now uh, with the, using the mobile, heading the mobile payment system Bcash. Uh, Estelle Braklianov from uh, Veolia, Senior Executive Vice President in the UK and Ireland. Um, Devin De Vries, uh, who's the CEO of, CEO of Where Is My Transport, will get a chance to explain what each of the companies do as we, as we go through. Uh, Jan from Hexagon in, uh, in Turkey, uh, and Richard Leftley from uh, CEO of uh, Micro Insure. Um, I'd like to start perhaps with Estelle, because I know that you've backed some work on the development of cities. Just to ask really what you think is, looking forward, the role of the private sector uh, in advancing sustainable urban transformation. How far does it go? I think it goes quite far, provided that you, you help us, you meaning cities, uh, to bring the solution to you. Um, and basically, I think we can have a solution in terms of some innovation, uh, again, provided that we are able to implement them. We, we've uh, commissioned a report, the, the, the one you just referred to, by, uh, we, that we've done uh, we, together with the London School of Economics. Uh, I think you can find it on website and the rest, it's called Imagine 2050, and it's basically what can the sustainable city of today, but actually of tomorrow, can look like in 2050. And basically we have like two options here. One which is the let's go on as we've done so far, which is I would say more the linear model, so the tech make dispose model, so it's a non-dense city, usually quite individualistic, which uh, spreads in terms of, you know, like a footprint. And obviously the other one is the opposite way around, which is more a circle or city, uh, more sustainable, more dense as well, more collaborative, and basically which brings a lot of solution together with the second model. Uh, and we were talking about, you know, public transport, but you can think of a lot of other stuff. In 2050, we've tried to put some uh, example of how a city could look like in this respect, and provided again that it's dense and collaborative, you could imagine that you don't need any, uh, any water to clean your bath tube because the bath tube would clean itself through uh, some type of technology that already exists, kind of. Uh, you can imagine to have nanorobots sorting your waste directly. Uh, so you can imagine a lot of stuff. And again, we are not very far from those technologies. You know, they already are almost there. So in 2050, there is no reason to believe that those couldn't exist. So basically, I feel like we are at the, uh, on the edge of a Galileo moment, if you, uh, I may say so, which is, you know, we are discovering that the world can be round, uh, and actually we can, you know, recirculate all that and, you know, transform those wasted stuff into resource. Uh, and as a company, Veolia, we're transforming ourselves from what used to be a wastewater and energy company into, in a way, a mining company, which is to try to find through this waste, this waste heat, this waste water, everything that could be transformed into something else and be given a second life. Uh, the good news is we're not only thinking about 2050, uh, we already start by like now, here, or in other places of the world. Uh, and 20% of our business together uh, is roughly circular now, already, as of today. And just if I can give two examples of that, this is uh, a chip uh, of plastic, which actually is made out of human sludge. Uh, so the poo that you've seen in the, trans in the presentation just before, uh, but there is a lot of R&D behind that, as you can imagine, a lot of patent and a lot of technology, but actually this exists already. Uh, this other one, so you can imagine what consequence it could have on the city of tomorrow if we were to implement that at a big scale. Uh, this is actually some platinum. Uh, usually I'm not given a lot by my team because this costs a lot, so I think there is like... A, 300 pounds or something in this little little sample. Uh, and actually, so platinum, as you know, is used not only for jewelry, but as well for microelectronics. Uh, and actually, this was found in the dust that we collect by street sweepings. So basically, in the street sweepings that we collect in cities like London, you have a lot of stuff, among which you have some rare metals, which basically comes from the exhaust pipes back into, let's say, the street. You sweep it, and then goes back into circles. So just a cool example to say basically, private sector can help finding those type of innovative solution which could close the loop and make the sustainable cities of tomorrow. And what's preventing at the moment the private sector from 
doing, doing more of this? What needs to be, what <coughs> obstacles might need to be taken away between now and 2050 in order to give the private sector the kind of role that would be mutually beneficial to companies and to municipalities? Uh, actually, um, in a way, let cities allow us, private sector, to be innovative. And uh, to do that, it means you have to tell us really what matters for you, and you have to be driven by the output as opposed to the input. So public tenders, and we've discussed uh, quite a lot in recent uh, uh, sessions about that, uh, quite a lot is about you know, what prevents us from already happening. If you tell us that you're not interested uh, actually to uh, this and specific technology, but just you, you want to tackle the fact of you know, having the waste going to landfill, we can have solutions. If you actually are a lot more too specific and too prospective, usually it prevents uh, companies to be more innovative. Right. So allow us to be innovative. Right. Rumi, same, same sort of question for you. What's, what is the role, what's the role of the private sector? How is it going to change? What are well, the obstacles to it? Uh, well, I can uh, give the example of what we are doing, uh, Vikash, you know. Uh, <coughs> We are not doing momentous things as you, but I think what we have done is gone to the bottom of the pyramid and tried to help them to uh, to save money and also to transport, transfer money, payments. Now, why is that important? You know, today in the morning we heard deindustrialization in cities has actually uh, caused problems for cities. I think there is another D happened in the cities, and that is de-SMEization. I think the, the, the cities have lost their SMEs, the mom and pop shop. You know, if you go to eat, you go to the big uh, chain stores. If you go to shop, you go to supermarkets. So, you do, and SMEs find it very difficult, particularly the small and the micro enterprise. They find it very difficult because they do not have the infrastructure. And one of the biggest infrastructure need is a bank account. Now, going to a bank is very expensive for the very small entrepreneurs and the micro-entrepreneurs. And that is where a technology like Bcash you know, has come in and uh, tried to help them. Uh, because it, it, this allows very small entrepreneurs and, and that to save money to actually do transactions. You know, you need to, if you want to sell something, you need to have a transaction and then you need somewhere to store the money. Bcash actually allows you to do that in a very, very cheap rate because what banks do in our country is have a minimum amount. You know, irrespective of the transaction, they have a minimum threshold. And that threshold makes it expensive because when you want to, uh, or for example, in Bcash, the, the average transaction size is around $15. Now, if you go to a bank to transfer $15, they'll take a minimum of, uh, that works out to 6.6%, uh, whereas we take 1.85%. So that way, you know, you are, you are allowing an infrastructure, a financial infrastructure to grow, which allows businesses, particularly small businesses. And I think that creates sustainability in, its, in itself. Right, and what is, the, is there a role for local government in your business, because other than Obviously, in some countries, still local authorities owning banks or stakes in banks. The regulation has generally been done on a national uh, or a broader level, not necessarily on a city level. You could, you could overlay the Bcash system on any city in the world, essentially, Absolutely. Without, without having to have permission from the local authority. No, yes, we do need permission. It is a regulated institution. Right. We need to go to the central bank. The central bank gives, it's a bank-led model. Uh, payments model, and we had to go to take the license from the central bank, and they sort of regulate us and they oversee us because you know it's money, people's right. money. But uh, individual concerned. cities would not have a say. No, no, no. Uh, they wouldn't. But I think cities can take can benefit from us in the sense that they have a lot of uh, money-based uh, transactions they do. For example, collections from uh, people, and then giving out money to different people, which are large scale, large scale. Right. And sometimes, you know, by the time it reaches the recipient, that money, has, a lot of charges are being paid. Now we can, over there, help them to, uh, to give this money out at minimum cost. Right. And it goes directly to that person. And the other thing, it also creates savings, you know. The people who 
need a safe because what do they do? What do pure, poor people do? They save, we put it under the pillow or in the house somewhere because they don't have a bank account. Right, right. So, you know, in many ways, it creates an infrastructure <coughs> for the economy. So I think it's, it's not only urban, it's, a, it's more than an urban, uh, urban uh, creating um, what you call it sustainability in the urban areas, it goes beyond that. Right, and you told me about a good example of rickshaw yes, the uh, rickshaw. operators in Dhaka, right? Yeah, who are mini entrepreneurs, you know. And they actually now, you know, accept payments in, in Bikash. And there was a survey done by one of the local newspapers, and they found that eight, 70 to 80% of the, of the rickshawalas in Dhaka actually use, have, have Bikash accounts, and are using the account. Right, right. So, so that gives me a nice little link into Devin's business. Um, just explain to us a little bit about how you're interacting with municipalities and urban challenges. Sure. Um, I mean, when, when we started off, just to give a little bit of context, we're a South African-based business. And, uh, you know, for many people, if you go to the likes of a New York or a London or San Francisco, you would be used to the ability to enjoy urban mobility just on your handset. Um, but in many of the emerging regions of the globe, it's that's a really tough thing to do because your your infrastructure is it, it's just not there to tap into. And where uh, transport does have different systems, they're all highly they are highly disparate, and it's, it's it's very difficult to pull them all together. And transport also or mobility within the emerging regions of the globe also functions fundamentally differently to how transport uh, functions in the first world. You've got a huge blend of paratransport. Uh, I mean, in South Africa, more than 70% of our movement occurs over this, this form of transport. Your tuk-tuks and tautus, chapas, minibuses, uh, they have different names. And the point is, government is unable to actually integrate their services because there's never, ever been any sort of digital solution to actually bring this all together. And what started off as just trying to make information available actually took us through what is now a seven-year journey to building out a platform that actually allows government to integrate their 30-year-old systems with their brand new 100 million plus you know, systems with also these new sectors that have completely run ungoverned. And the goal is that hopefully in building a platform that brings together all these various pieces of technology and these various stakeholders, we can connect what is basically a network of, of disconnects. You know, uh, all these operators function independently in silos, and the more we sort of, this is obviously not how we started off, but the more we're getting embedded in the space, the more we're realizing, and, and, and the sentiments were echoed earlier uh, in some of the earlier sessions, this information could be very useful to urban planners, to many other divisions of government, and what we're trying to do is find a way to bring it all together in one place, and open it up so that other people can innovate. Other people can go on and build that app, right. that smart screen, and urban planners can hopefully dig in to the data. I mean, what we're doing now in, in Cape Town is we're actually putting, connecting all their systems onto this unified platform, but we're also funneling all the data back into the city, into a warehouse. So the city can do an analytics on it, but they can also open it up to the public. Um, so to be clear, you're not, you're not essentially saying we can impose order on chaos. You're saying actually we can link what looks like chaos so that people can use it across the complexity of lots of different transport systems. Correct, because uh, this whole idea of a greenfield scenario where you can just wipe everything out, you know, and just put in one platform, one solution, that can, it's, it's impossible. But you're working and, with and, what? And you're going to waste of, a lot of previous investments. So right. right. What we're trying to do is find a way to allow the governments to essentially leverage the old, the new, as well as, you know, create that uh, extensibility within the framework so that they can keep growing as they go forward. Right. Shan, what, what, what do you see as the future of private sector involvement? Um, how does it, how can it? Let me just take this example and extrapolate yeah, from please. them. So uh, I think that we face the same type of problems in developing environments. And for example, in the Turkish environment, local transportation is having the same type of problems that uh, we've just heard about. And minibuses, small vehicles, are uh, carrying a lot of weight of public transportation, but that is something that actually, for example, Western cities have not done up to now, and it can now become a solution for Western cities, because in Western cities, you are, you've got an urban sprawl, which is generally served by the private car, 
you haven't the, the ability to bring private transportation to that area because the vehicles that you use either are rail bound vehicles or they are large buses and it doesn't have it doesn't give you the uh, the connectivity that you need that you can have with small vehicles uh, large vehicles neither can reach the place nor can have the the type of uh, concentration for urban transportation that you need to operate those vehicles so for example to look at the role that the private sector can have 10 years ago in turkey a rule a, a, the government came up with legislation that all city transportation needs to be inclusive that is wheelchair bound people or people which are uh, who are mobility impaired need to be able to accede to urban transport vehicles this is good for modern large buses those minibuses weren't designed accordingly they are van uh, and, and van derived vehicles so you cannot put in a wheelchair in now most of the automotive industry in the world just doesn't do that they don't work for that we for example we decided that we would abide by legislation and design a specific vehicle for that so uh, the government said i will apply the law seven years into the future so gave the automotive industry enough time to integrate and change their, their vehicles accordingly. Nobody did it because they didn't want to do it. So we were the only company that really did this. We came up with the vehicle. We had all the automotive industry turned against us, saying to the government, the automotive industry is not ready. We can't do it. They didn't want to have the change happen. So we had to fight with legislators and with the government to try and get them accept the law that they initially had done because nobody else wanted to follow it. So there's a big role with the private sector, actually, with the government, because the government, cities are under pressure to change. I mean, we've, we've talked about this. So this transformation coming from the economic uh, pressures, coming from environmental pressures, coming from technology opportunities. So t cities uh, need to evolve and change uh, for a better opportunity. And the private sector's role is there to be able to give the solutions so that the government can then apply them in their environment. For right. example, there's, there's another, excuse me, there's another uh, similar case in London, for example. London, if I'm not wrong, will face the challenge to pay the EU 300 million e euros per year if they cannot come up with uh, ecologic taxes or low emission vehicles from 2018 onwards. Now, if the industry doesn't come up with solutions for London, for this solution, unfortunately, the government London, the mayor, won't have the solution to, right. to apply it. So it, the private sector role is there to come with solutions to solve the environmental pressures or the urbanization pressures that exist around that. Right. It's a major role. So one is the legislator, the decider. The other one is there to give the solution and provide for solutions. And we've got similar things in all sorts of urban life. Waste is the same thing. So Right. We, we have a similar experience with waste. Let me let others talk and then we can, I can pick sure. up on Richard, the waste uh, what's, subject. What's been your experience uh, in essentially dealing with the public sector with your private sector solution? Sure. So um, MicroInsure uh, is a company that I founded about 12 or 13 years ago now. Um, and, and principally we set out because we noticed that 98% of people in Africa and Asia didn't actually have access to insurance. And yet, you know, if you look at the, the Nepalese earthquake, if you look at um, the Philippine typhoons, if you look at any of the natural disasters that affect large urban areas or, or even rural areas, it's always, well, it's mostly the poor that are, that are most dis disproportionately affected by these events. So we were fascinated by why it was that low-income and middle-income people simply didn't buy insurance, and yet they faced such high level of risk. Um, and over the last... Uh, 12 or 13 years, we have created a range of, of very simple products which simply work, you know, uh, that, that don't have all the exclusions, don't have uh, all the fine print of, of many financial services, um, whereby claims can be paid within, within hours or in some cases maximum in a few days. And today, you know, we're serving 15 million consumers um, across Africa and Asia, and we're signing up more than a million uh, consumers every month uh, new to insurance. So I think we, we, we have found a way to do this, but um, at the moment, really, our experience has been that we distribute our products entirely through the private sector. So we're working with banks, with microfinance organizations, and also with mobile phone networks um, to reach these consumers. And um, over the course of our development, I think we've become um, very interested in, in how to engage with the public sector. And in fact, we have tried to do that on a number of occasions. And I think our experience as a relatively small company, you know, we're not an IBM, we're not a Microsoft, we are this small, relatively small company, 
you know, which, which has you know, seemed to find some solutions to some big problems. But nevertheless, we are a small company. We found it extremely difficult to, to actually engage with the public sector. And in fact, I think in, in many cases, um, the ex I think our experience has been that we're actually seen somewhat as, as outsiders or potentially as competitors. So, for example, uh, we have a range of health insurance products, um, which are, are amongst our most popular products um, uh, you know, amongst our client base today. And when we, when we have launched those products, the, the, the fiercest kind of um, critics of those products have actually been the governments in some cases, um, or in fact large uh, NGOs, or cities themselves, because provision of healthcare is actually a, a public good. It's something which the government is supposed to be doing. And yet, when you go to the hospitals, you find that there are no doctors, and you find that there are no drugs. And those doctors and those drugs are around the corner in the private clinics. So whilst we may agree as a company that actually health should be provided by the public sector. Um, actually, at the moment, if you go to many of the cities um, that we work in around the world, you'll find that the public systems aren't actually working for the low and the middle income sectors. And so as a result, our response as the private sector is to say, well, let's step in, let's provide a solution that works for people. And when the public sector is ready to engage with us, then we're absolutely, we'd love to, we'd, we, we would love to work with the public sector in a, in a PPP, but it seems extremely difficult to get those, uh, those opportunities up and running and to, um, and to not be viewed as a competitor uh, when you're coming from the private sector. And you, you started off, if I understand correctly, trying in that area to replace <coughs> uh, government. Right. Well, well we, we, we launched products because we, we saw that um, people were complaining that the, that the public right. sector solutions weren't working for them. Um, and so we, we started to come along with private sector solutions. And I think you know, our, where we're at in our development is that um, we are hoping to demonstrate that we are capable, as a private sector player, to provide solutions, to provide almost the train tracks uh, upon which the train can run, and to demonstrate that we can do that at scale uh, and that we can operate efficiently, and perhaps in many cases more efficiently than the public sector. But the most, the, the most efficient that we can be is where we then engage that private solution with the kind of scale and with the, uh, and with the kind of um, convening power that, of course, the government brings. I mean, we're never going to have that convening power. Um, so I, I think you know, we, we are fascinated by what the future will hold for us as a small private company. And we're hoping very much that people will sit up and take notice of the progress that we've made in, in some very difficult areas. Um, so not just healthcare, but you know, how do we deal with calamities? So when calamities affect um, uh, some of the cities that we work in, you know, we paid over 100,000 claims as a result of Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. Um, or, or, or what happens when the government needs to clear a slum area, for example? We have, a, we have an insurance product so that if the government clears your slum, then we'll pay for you to rebuild your business um, you know, in, in the newly designated areas. A whole range of different products, which you know, we're thinking very differently about. about but, at, but at this point, you're not engaging directly with government on those products. I think it's, not, it's, not, I think it's not at the moment a partnership. Sure, we, we have in the past. So um, we were involved, for example, with the Indian government in rolling out their um, RSBY health insurance program. Um, so we played a role in going to the villages, signing people up um, onto a government-funded um, health insurance program. Um, but in fact, we found that that, was, uh, that product, that there were a number of flaws in that product, and the feedback we were getting in working with the Gates Foundation and with McKinsey's was that we couldn't affect the design of that program. It was a government-led program. Um, and as a result, that actually forced us to, to actually leave India and to go into Africa and try some new ideas, right. which we then launched with, with mobile phones. So, so I suppose the general question that, I, that I'd like to try and get at is whether there's more of an... Um, in the first uh, panel this morning, Joe Beale talked about the uh, entrepreneurial opportunity provided by, by these fast-growing uh, urban areas. Is that opportunity for private sector businesses um, more in making the most of the informal economy that's developing? Or is there a as great or even a greater opportunity in a partnership with uh, the public sector, which at the moment looks like the more difficult option? You know, things grow up, growing up organically, you're taking opportunities as you have, Richard, and, and to, to some degree, Devin um, and Jan, in, the, in that informal, fast-growing economy, private sector, rather than the potentially bigger opportunity in the public sector. But uh, I think that there's a tacit relationship between the government and the, uh, the private sector anyway, even if it is an informal way of right. doing business. One way or the other, the two have got to work together. Right. So you cannot dissociate them from each other. 
and really there one has got to accept that the rule setter is the government. They set the rules. The private sector has either f to find a way and navigate within the rules and the boundaries that are set or actively engage the government yes. in trying to make them see and evolve and change. Let me just take another example that I said I would take with the, with the waste industry. For example, Turkey is trying to exceed the, the EU. It's got to apply the acquis communautaire. There are chapters that we need to sign. One of the um, chapters that have been signed, the few chapters that have been signed between the EU and Turkey is the chapter on the environment. Now, to be able to adhere to the national program that we have given to the EU, uh, there are tremendous amount of investments. Now, no government or no municipality is able to do it with a four-year or five-year uh, re-election period. They cannot engage. So the only thing that they go is they go and, and do the basic investments. We've come up with a new model, for example. So we've approached them and we work with the government and universities to create a framework in which we are able to get concessions so we get long-term concessions. This is something that we've changed the infrastructure, the legal infrastructure, to be able to acquire uh, concessions. And now municipalities have gone tendering and conceding the waste to us. So we just get hold of the waste. They said, waste is valuable, we give it to you. In counterpart, you solve our waste problem altogether. And there are some criteria that they want us to do. Produce energy, do the recycling, do this, do that, etc. And so they give us a framework. We've worked it with them. They give us a framework of the things that we need to do, and we do it on their behalf. So we have modeled together with the government a new way of doing business. I think this is the responsibility of the private business. Right. To be ingenious and inventive, innovative, not only in products, but also in the way they work together with the government. Right. Estelle, you talked about output over input, so no longer the kind of pile of papers that says you, we, from gov local government saying you need to do it this way, price it for us. Is that what you're seeing as well? Yes, and I would, uh, to, to follow up on your example, let's say I'm a, a city, I have, let's say, two ways of procuring my waste to go to your road. You have the, unfortunately, too traditional way or too common way, which is, I think my solution due to have energy from waste here, a uh, recycling center there, uh, to have uh, twice as much composting, whatever, and I think the good site is here, and you should have the trucks this big, uh, on which day of the week to collect it from here, to go there, and that's it, that's my thunder. That's a traditional way. Of course you can have solutions, usually they're, uh, you know, like uh, quite for the big companies, let's be honest, and it goes back to your point about SMEs and access to public thunder. And you have the other way around, which is to say, basically have this amount of waste, and what can you do, because my problem is to avoid, you know, like not doing anything with it, so basically going to landfill or be compliant in terms of the decision, the rest is yours. Uh, I think it's, it's a more uh, trustful relationship with the private sector, so it's not only I want you to finance, but I want to design every single bit of the solution. It's actually the outcome is this, avoid going to landfill, what can you do for me? And you know, in various countries, uh, even in the, uh, in the more, I would say, uh, uh, traditional European countries, you know, you have had not the one, the first one, and the later as well. Uh, and actually, the later does work incredibly much better than the first one, uh, without any doubt. And I would say, on the second type of solution, you can either, as a big company, bring you with you more innovative SMEs uh, to answer to this one. You can bring solutions which are outside the box. Oh, by the way, you didn't need any, any energy from waste. You actually need this and that provided that you have this uh, global solution approach. So I think really like the output-based uh, solution is really, really something which is, which is critical. So let the public sector bring the solution and uh, you design what the output should look like. Right. Uh, Rumi, I'm just looking at the sort of sustainable part of this, um, clearly sustainable implies we're looking at 2050, we're looking at cities that we want to be um, working well 30, 40, even 100 years hence, is pri are private sector solutions adaptable to that long-range approach? I mean, is one of the problems that actually it's, it's short-term meets long-term when private sector contracts with cities for I think it has solutions? to be. It has to be, uh, uh, to be sustainable. It has to be a private sector, public sector. You know, I think fundamentally the, the city government should be the people 
giving the rules, regulations, and things like that. And the private sector will play the role of ser delivering services. That would be a long-term ultimate solution. I think we have to move away from city providing everything. Right. Like, you know, you are now. The private sector is saying that we have the solutions. What is it you need? The output-based solutions. And if that is what future cities will be asking for, then I think, uh, and, it, and it creates transparency, because at the end of the day, I, am, I as, a, uh, as a citizen or living in a city, I want the output. I don't, I'm not interested how it was done. I'm interested in, of course, I'm interested in the transparency and the integrity of the, of the service, but at the same time, I want the product. And if I want the product, then it should be an output-based output -based, uh, system. And I think this is where uh, the private sector can do it in the most efficient way, rather than you know city government doing it. Of course, there should be a city government. There should be rules and regulations. It should be regulated. But I don't think you know it's the. I don't think the government should be in the in the um, ultimately in the area of providing services. It should be a private sector solution. I, what are the limits though of the private sector? Private sector involvement. I mean, Richard encountered one when he tried to do healthcare um, insurance in the, in the infringing, if you like, on what the public I, sector believed was its domain. I think it's mindset, essentially, you know. Uh, from my experience, it has been mindset. You know, private <coughs> sector, uh, there is a suspicion, you know, that the private sector will, uh, there will be uh, lack of integrity, there could, there, because at the end of the day, I think the politicians also feel that we are answerable and they cannot trust. Uh, I think there, there is an element of mindset and trust issue involved over here. Right. Uh, I think that is what we need to sort out. Right. Uh, if you ask the electorate, I, I, I think they will say that we want the solution. Right. And if that's what we are looking for, what everybody is talking about today, that we want output, output, best, output based solutions. Uh, and it should be the most efficient one. Right. And the only you're, process. You're, you're yeah, I was going as well. to, to uh, attribute to the being slightly controversial. You implied a little bit like uh, 2050, you know, the public sector will be very long term and the private sector very short term. So how can those two meet? In your question, I could be wrong. Uh, the, the, the way I would disagree slightly is, you know, like we all have faced the election cycles. Uh, so the, I'm not so sure the public sector would be much more longer term in the decision process, not in the thinking that's something different, but in the decision process than the private sector. I think you know you could <coughs> you could discuss about that as an option, uh, and as an answer to that one uh, for me. Uh, what is absolutely key is the stability or the uh, visibility of the long term. So let me give you another example about waste, for instance. What has driven the major investment that this country, uh, the UK, I mean, uh, have attracted from the private sector in avoiding going to landfill? Because 15 years ago, everything was going to landfill in this single country here. Now it's not the case anymore. What has happened? A lot of investments. Why? Because there was a landfill tax, which was initially at zero pound per ton and which went out uh, up to 80 pound per ton over the last 10 years like ramped up very progressively but the fascinating stuff about that is you've noticed that this government has been from left to right and right to left again or the opposite way around by the way but you know in the last 15 years so whatever uh, the government this you know like plan right. and the, the government has stick to the plan and that is exactly the the solution for attracting some private investment, some stability we knew and we've known for 15 years that today the landfill tax would be at 80 pounds per ton. Right. So I think stability and visibility is absolutely key for private investments. I mean, how, how confident, Devin, are you? Obviously, Veolia is a big, well established, long term uh, player in this market, You're, whereas my transport is very new. Yeah. Uh, does it make you nervous? Do you lie awake at night worrying that the governments that you deal with, local governments, might not might suddenly switch course and leave you out of pocket? Um, you know, when when we started off, it was very very tricky. You know, naturally, politics 101 isn't something that you typically cover if you're doing computer science. But right. <laughs> um, 
going into the space, we didn't really know how to address government, how to open up a dialogue with government. And with time, we came to realize that as opposed to waiting to, to see what they were issuing out, you know, we, we referred to those, those, those specifications that they would put out, we started to realize that we actually needed to, we, we were thinking about our subject area or our, our subject matter the, an, an incredible amount, possibly beyond what any of the, the persons in that public sector space were thinking about because they had a lot of other issues that they were having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And what we actually need to do was rather go and sit with these various stakeholders and speak to them about their needs. What are the things that they need in this? A lot of these things also would dovetail together. So you'd speak to the mayor and the mayor would say, I really would love to have a dialogue with my citizen. You know, when they come in and out of, of the city, whatever, wherever they're interacting with the city, I'd like to be able to have a dialogue with them. And you speak to the transport director, and the transport director says, I'd really like to pull all of my, all of these different modes of transport together. And you know, you'd speak to someone in the urban planning section, and, and they, they also have a set of goals. And so we actually started collecting these needs together and innovating in our private space on trying to answer to these needs. I mean, we've been speaking a lot about these outputs and getting to a point where we can actually come up with uh, something that weaves together these, these needs, then going back to the government going, oh, here's something, if, you, if you're willing to give it a go, um, you know, t take a chance. And right. That, that, that was our foot through the door. That, right. that was our way of actually... And, and governments it. were prepared to take a chance. Doesn't sound like a typically con city conservative government, conservative with a small city. Yeah, the, okay, so we had to nudge them a little. <laughs> right. So, so the way in which we did that was, you know, we tried to take a solution to them, they said, mm, we're going to have to put out a, a, a tender process or something for all of this. So we said, okay, fine, well, how about we'll just do it ourselves? And so we deployed this, this thing into the public space and suddenly it started getting rapid uptake from all of their citizens. They were like, oh, wait a second, actually we would like to own that conversation. And at that point, as opposed to trying to hold on to it, we said, with pleasure. And so we were actually able to hand them the platform, say, brand it, make it your own. You know, public transport is just the first of the verticals through which you'll have a dialogue with your citizen. All many other things will follow. But it was really handing that platform over to them and saying, right. now many other people can approach you and innovate and build on top of it. And so, so rather like City, um, Gustav from City of Stockholm was saying this morning, you, you ran a pilot, essentially, which when it succeeded, they were able to see the advantages. The, the, the validation, the, yeah. yes. Interesting. Richard? Yeah, I think it, it, it really boils down to that, this word innovation. So, you know, the way it feels from, the, from, from where I sit as a private sector player is that when, when the public sector is looking for a solution, it's already pretty much decided what the answer is going to be. So by the time the document you know, goes out there or by the time they're looking for a, a solution to a problem, the document or the process has been written in such a way that pretty much guarantees a certain kind of outcome. Um, so you know, if, um, if the City of London, if Transport for London um, said, look, we've got a problem with... Um, with how to get people around this fantastic city. And their solution for the last 20, 30, 50 years has been the underground, buses, and licensed taxis, all of which has worked fairly well. And yet, most of us tonight, or at least half of us tonight, will probably get our phones out and open up Uber and jump in an Uber car and go home. And so that isn't a solution that came about because the public sector innovated. And so you know, I think the governments are fantastic at doing many, many things. But typically, they're not great at innovating. And so if we want to find solutions to some of these big problems that we're, that we're facing, I think where cities and where governments need to get to is to say, here is the problem. Come to me and talk to me about what kind of solution you could come up with to address that problem. But you don't need to come from this background or that background. You don't need to have this system requirement or this kind of capability. What you need to do is come to me and, and demonstrate that you have a solution to the problem that I'm facing and we will measure your, your solution based on its merits. And that, that would be a much better uh, approach to be able to then generate genuine innovation. So Uber came about because it's a, it's a link, it's simply linking excess supply with demand. It's completely outside of the, the public sector. But if the public sector had come forward and said, we have a problem with public transport, it would have been interesting to, to, to have seen whether Uber would have, would have happened in the way in which it has. Yeah, I mean, there's a question of whether, of whether any local authority would have identified that there was a problem with public transport, given well, that they Friday, were working Friday night, on, a, on a rainy Friday night standing in Covent Garden, it's pretty damn obvious right. there's not enough taxis. So. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, Rumi. <laughs> yeah, uh, 
you know, I think in, yeah. uh, in, in our case also, there was this uh, government uh, willingness or the central bank willingness to, to create inclusivity in, uh, in the financial system because most of the people at the bottom of the pyramid didn't have access to uh, a bank account. So one of the solutions they initially thought was opening 10 taka accounts, you know, which is 10 takas, 80 takas make a dollar, so you can, it's one eighth of a dollar. So it's about 10 cents, 15 cents. Now that, they opened accounts, but that doesn't work very well because I think very poor people find it uh, is a, difficult to go to a the bank branch, which may be far away from home, or it can be forbidding in many ways because there's a bank manager who probably wears a tie and a suit and, you know, in Bangladesh, uh, in the villages, they find it intimidating. I think that is where Bikash and other uh, payments uh, <coughs> operators, the mobile payments operators came in and uh, created a solution because we have, uh, we have opened accounts, we open accounts for all of them. We have about close to 18 million customers. We've been around for about only three and a half, four years. So, and uh, together the industry has, I think, 25 million. So, you know, this is a big step, and it's growing very fast, right. this industry. So this will, is the first step towards financial inclusivity, because they were outside the system, this whole population. Right. So here's another example um, to add to yours, you know, where the solution was provided by the private sector. Right. Um, John, you had something to add on yes, that? Yes, sure. Then we'll go to questions, if you have them. Just two things to say. It's something like Uber, for example, yes, it is there, it is innovation, but it doesn't solve all the problems. I mean, it cannot serve everybody. There are people that cannot afford Uber, for example. So the government's role, the city's role, is to be able to give everybody a certain level of service right. at a certain level. So there might be some technological solutions that come here and there, but that doesn't take the role of the government away completely. They've got to be there to make sure that they are able to give equal service to all the citizens that are living in the city and give them the opportunity to live in the city. And just because we are involved with it, I mean, London, for example, is, has been contacting the private sector tremendously to solve this problem of low emission vehicles. So it's not that they, they are not aware of it. So governments are aware of change and are engaging the private sector to foster change and development. So it's, it's not a simple complex, a, a solution. It's a complex issue. There are all sorts of problems tied to it. And there's not just one answer that, uh, that one can approach and say, this is the way to do it. It's going to be a, a, an array of solutions and a way of doing business that is going to solve the transformation that the cities and the urban environment requires. Right, very good point about the, the, the safety net, the baseline that the go that government still has to provide. Um, questions for the panel or, or issues that uh, you think we haven't raised that should be raised? I'm looking into the uh, distance here. Otherwise, I'll come back. Yes, one over here. Uh, Say who you are and who uh, you Jeremy are. Anastin, Farrells and Urban Design Group. Uh, I think it's very interesting. We, we've been talking about private sector, public sector, but mostly we're talking about private businesses, which are apparently uh, innovative, highly proactive, of a certain scale, or at least with a, a certain e ethos. Uh, I think it was mentioned the automotive industry in Turkey, but uh, how do you relate to, to big businesses of a certain scale and maybe some uh, legacy business, I'm thinking automotive again, energy, chemicals, businesses which got a certain scales, and in the example you gave apparently in Turkey with transport, are more willing to try to change the regulations uh, to avoid uh, the solve, the, an issue being solved than actually being innovative and, and provide public bodies with what's happening. Because here we're talking about private, public, and why is there a distress from uh, a number of people towards private sector? I think it's also in part because uh, a number of older, very big corporation uh, have didn't prove to have a, a, a netos as the people here have shown uh, tonight. Right, it's a, it's a good point about the, about the, essentially just to take that on a second, the incumbent businesses are often fighting to get governments to do the reverse of innovating because they don't want to be disrupted. I mean, we've seen this in, is that what you 
I, well, partly encountered in I, Turkey. I, I said that there are, there are businesses which today are operational and they would prefer not to change. So they are against change because they've got an environment which they've got their, their comfort zone. They're making money in that comfort zone and change is disruptive for them. So they're not sure how they're going to deal with it. And there are new companies in the new environment that would challenge them. So there are a lot of private uh, um, sector companies that would prefer not to change anything. And so they are the people that are bring, uh, pulling the governments back rather than helping them make the change. Right. So, so, so uh, as I said, it's a, complex, it's a complex issue, especially for the governments, because new companies, you don't know if they're going to deliver, really. They say they're going to deliver, but in the end, there's the responsibility for the government to make sure that if they say they're going to make the change, they've got to deliver and perform in the long term, be sustainable in the long term. While well, they've got the comfort of the old companies and old technologies that are doing it at the moment. So uh, also, this is a, a, a difficulty in treating the subject. Right. Will the change happen? Will they deliver? And if you are very conservative about it, no change happens. Right. So therefore, for example, pilot uh, operations, which, uh, which show you that it can happen, are, are important. Estelle, representing yeah. large companies. I don't know, I feel like surrounded by innovative SMEs, <laughs> wondering if a big blue chip company could be innovative. I hope I've demonstrated it. Uh, and actually, uh, even big companies know that they can fail. Uh, and you know, like you know, you imagine that the Uber has disrupted totally the market, and I don't see any single big company w which is not wondering now what's going to happen, and therefore I have to change and have to change quick. Uh, so I think we can have innovation as well in big companies, uh, and we've proven it like dramatically in Veolia. Again, 20% of our business, which is circular, where 10 years ago we were making money out of the same landfills we've talked about. You know, it's a quick transformation for us. Uh, having said that, I think you know the big uh, solution for big companies is to try and understand what they can do and what they cannot. So that's why I talk about partnership with SMEs or partnership with startups. Uh, and it's what I found the most difficult to explain to my team. Whatever you're talented, uh, actually you have to partner, you have to build relationships, you have to in a way or another uh, bring them with us as opposed to try to do 100% yourself. But isn't part of the thing that big companies do well is building the relationship with the existing government structures and then lobbying to keep the relationship as it is with those, in other words, to protect the rules that have protected the business of the big company. Again, I'm not suggesting that Veolia does this. Isn't this just one of the things that big companies do? It's one of the things which can happen at times. Uh, but the opposite can happen as well. Uh, we are lobbying about a uh, circular economy very hard in the EU for the new legislation which will be uh, hopefully voted for this year and so on and so forth. So both can happen. So when you have big blue chip which pledge in the favor of you know, the innovation, I think it makes things hopefully quicker to happen. That's it. So you can have both, but right. please don't generalize. No. John? Are you going to ask the same question to me? I'm I, asking you. By all means, I, I come from a small to middle-sized company. I've always fought against large companies. I think they all are out. They, they, they try to keep the status quo as is as much as possible because it's normal. And then they drive innovation as much as they want to drive innovation. So, but as you say, there's both, and big companies make a lot of innovation. Right. No, I agree on that. I invite you to visit some of our Accepted. sites, our innovation den, and the rest Accepted. of it. Accepted. Any other questions from the, from the floor? Yes, um, right at the front here. Just wait for a microphone, if you could. Coming in from here. Um, uh, it is a question on, uh, um, well, my name is Beatrice Armendariz, and I am uh, uh, from uh, Financiera Sustentable. So my question is uh, with regards to microinsurance. Uh, could you please explain to us a little bit how could the model be self-sustainable or how could uh, uh, microinsurance be uh, subsidy free and what is your vision for the future? Sure. Um, uh, microinsure is a, is a for-profit company, uh, has investors which include uh, large insurance companies like AXA insurance company, as well as mobile phone companies like Telenor uh, and also the IFC, um, a whole range of, of different um, investors. Um, we don't have any subsidy um, outside of you know, raising of equity um, to, to fund the business. 
um, and um, all of our products uh, operate on a, on a profitable basis. So yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think scale is the most important component for microinsurance. So for us, um, that's why we, we are fascinated by the public sector. We've been working with the telcos, um, principally the, the, the kind of growth that we're seeing of say a million new customers a month has come mostly through our partnership with large mobile phone networks in, in Africa and in Asia. Um, but of course, we're very aware that the public sector would give us even more scale, and that's why we're, we're fascinated in, in working with the public sector. Um, the, the biggest issue in, 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 the, in the shape of microinsurance, actually, um, everyone assumes that the problem will be lots of losses arising from these low-income people. Actually, that's not the case. The challenge is, um, is in controlling the sales and distribution cost associated with educating the consumer, helping them understand how the product works, and then also servicing their claims quickly. <coughs> um, the, 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 the problem with claims is not that we get too many, it's that we get too few. So we, we actually, um, one of the things that I look at every single week as a CEO, the, the, the report I'm most interested in, is looking at how many claims we've received on each product, because quite often it's below what we expect. Um, because people forget that they have the insurance, or they're not sure how to make the claims. And that, of course, is a big problem for us, because if they're not using it, then they're not going to continue being our clients. I'm afraid we've run out of time for further questions. Um, very happy to have had representatives of big and small, new and old on the, on the panel. I'm sure we're going to see more of them uh, in this sector in the coming years. Uh, so let me just uh, invite you to uh, thank the panel for their contributions. <laughs>